Hello, welcome to Dog Food with Catherine Abel, telling stories about dogs that feed the mind and spirit. Today we have too many to mention. Alpha Tharp calls the police when she sees the unbelievable on her cell phone news feed. She isn't the only one. There are others. In fact, there have been a reported 39 other incidences. Like her, the other victims also receive explicit videos of their beloved dogs. She knows she's using the word explicit correctly because she looked it up. Explicit means fully and clearly expressed, leaving nothing merely implied, fully developed or formulated, without vagueness or ambiguity, leaving no question as to meaning or intent. And the villain, thief, kidnapper, he or she or his or her team has done exactly that. There is absolutely no question as to the message that that awful individual or individuals who stole her baby are conveying. She wants to hate them so much. Sheriff Wilson Wall in Warina County, Mississippi, is the first one to take the incident seriously. It's because of his high regard and appreciation of life that the matter is resolved at all. When Fran Lightsey reports that Sunshine has been missing for 12 hours, he takes it seriously and treats the matter as if a human child has been reported missing. When Wilson, a tall, dark-skinned, ruggedly handsome man with a bald head and broad, muscular shoulders, was elected sheriff two years ago, he promised positive change. In fact, that was his campaign slogan and eventual staff mantra, a positive promise of change. But the way he went about implementing the change was a grand puzzle. Until the somewhat lazy and somewhat good citizens witnessed the changes his bizarre actions brought about. They never expected something so foreign to their way of thinking and existing to actually produce results. Many, no, no, a whole dead gum lot of them protested and were eventually shocked to find out they didn't have a leg to stand on. Everything he did or said was clearly written in the law books. It was just that up until this point, Everybody pretended it wasn't. What Sheriff Rawl proceeded to do was completely legal and within his power and the eight sheriffs before him. It was just that no one had ever done it, so no one knew it could not only be done, but it could be enforced. Why, he even had the police jury ban the chaining and tethering the dogs. Who, who, who ever heard of that? How are they supposed to keep the dogs in the yard yet away from themselves? It, it, it made no sense until it made sense. Nobody would have believed it if they themselves hadn't actually seen it and lived it. When the sheriff and his deputies began writing tickets and making arrests for animal neglect, cruelty, and abuse, the county residents couldn't understand what was happening. After all, they'd been starving, torturing, fighting, dumping, shooting dogs, cat, raccoons, you name it, for as long as anyone could remember. How come it was okay before? Because before... Wilson Rawl had not been there swearing to protect all life and then actually proceeding to do what he'd sworn to do. His neighbors and family were just as shocked as everyone else when the laws began to be enforced in earnest, especially so when Sheriff Rawl began enforcing the laws with his neighbors and family members right off the bat. The judges couldn't do a thing about it since it was against the law to starve, torture, fight, dump, and shoot for no reason any animal in the state of Mississippi. The fact that Wilson graduated at the top of his law school class and was wilier than any old silver spoon-fed judge ever thought about being was something no one could deny. They helped him uphold the law not because it was actually the law, but because secretly all the judges in Warena County were intimidated by the unflinching gaze of the tall, no-nonsense man and his undisputed knowledge of the law. It, it was as though he'd memorized every single law in the Mississippi law books. He hadn't. But he was a sober-minded man on a mission who also happened to possess a photographic memory. They did what he wanted because they had to. It, it was the law. They didn't like it at first, but they sure did a year and a half later when statistics proved a 70% decrease in all crime. Violence was on the wane in Warena County, and everybody sure liked that. If all it took to maintain a nearly crime-free county was teaching people how to take care of their animals, teaching them that all life has value, 
Well, then so be it. Last week, a unanimous vote was obtained that put into play a mandatory spay-neuter law. Sheriff Rawl told people this would end the senseless killing of healthy companion animals and soon abolish the need for animal shelters altogether. People looked at each other and shrugged. What could they say? So far, everything he told them proved true. The Vickletown mayor was pleasantly surprised by the number of industries expressing interest in opening factories and businesses in the city and all around it. It made him wonder, why hadn't they been protecting animals all along? Wilson is sitting on his front porch, just about to get up and replenish the bird feeder in the purple chase tree with black old sunflower seeds when he gets the call. It's 7.30, August 4th, on a bright-eyed Sunday morning. He'll never forget the day or time or what he was doing. He was watching a red-bellied woodpecker bully a bright red cardinal at the nearly empty plastic barn shed bird feeder. He listens carefully to Deputy Brinson's report while watching the cardinal refuse to give way. He listened as he did to all reports of crime, as if the victim were the most important, most precious creation on the planet, a being, whether human or animal, who deserved to live a life free of threat, menace, or unjust imposed suffering. When he watches the video from the link Deputy Brinson sends him, he laughs out loud. He can't help it. He's so glad only his trustworthy wife witnesses it. The video, posted on a YouTube page called Free French Bulldogs, was of Fran Lightsey's purebred French bulldog, Sunshine. Deputy Brinson reported that Mrs. Lightsey had purchased Sunshine from a licensed breeder for $4,700 four years ago. Sunshine is a light gray French bulldog. Her coat is so healthy and beautiful it appears to shine like real silver in the video. Mrs. Lightsey had stated, she is light-colored and a perpetual bright light in my life. That's why I named her Sunshine. In the video, Sunshine is wearing a gold lame evening gown with matching gold lame high-heeled pumps. There are tiny glistening gold satin bows on the shoulder straps of the gown. Long, fake eyelashes have somehow been attached to her eyebrow area. The lashes are very long and very sparkly. Deputy Brinson, after consulting Dr. Marjorie Whitaker, a local and respected doctor of veterinary medicine, he noted and reported that Sunshine did not appear to be presenting signs of distress, per Dr. Whitaker's dedicated visual assessment. Mrs. Lightsey informed Deputy Brinson that she dresses Sunshine frequently, but never, never, ever, in a full-length gold lame gown. And never, never, did she put shoes on her? Never in her life. <laughs> As Wilson studies the video, he can't help but come to the unmistakable conclusion that not only was the kidnapping carefully planned, it was meticulously planned. A great deal of creative consideration was given to this crime. As he watches the video with law enforcement eyes, he must admit he's impressed with the amount of detail. The light gray French bulldog is obviously on a set constructed to perfectly suit and complement her size. There's a small mirrored ball going round and round on the ceiling of the set, while various colored lights bedazzle the already bedazzled walls. Someone has glued thousands upon thousands of different colored crystals onto the three visible walls of the set. Sunshine is sitting down on her haunches, and the two gold pumps on her back feet have flopped off. The ones on her front feet remain steadfast. The expression on the dog's face is one of patient suffering. She sits quietly while bright sparkles of light move to the rhythm of royalty-free electronic dance music. She doesn't appear stressed or injured. She sits calmly in the glittering evening gown which fits her perfectly, pooling elegantly around her. From time to time, she will gaze at the turning ball. The video lasts for 52 seconds exactly. Before he calls Mrs. Lightsey, he makes contact with his IT team to try and trace the source of the upload of the video. He quickly drafts a preliminary subpoena for Judge Mathis Arant to sign, which he will then present to YouTube to make them share the name and contact information of the owner of the account as quickly as possible. Once Mrs. Lightsey finishes crying and pulls herself together long enough to direct Sheriff Rawl to Sunshine's Instagram account, the interrogation begins in earnest. Sheriff Rawl, 
You told Deputy Brinson that Sunshine was missing for 12 hours before you realized she was gone, Fran Lightsey. That's because, Sheriff Rawl, you see, sometimes my daughter and her daughters will come and get her while I run errands. They'll come get her and take her to their home, Sheriff Rawl. And this is where they take the Instagram photos of her, dressed up in clothes? Friend Lightsey. No, sometimes we take the photos here at my house. Sunshine loves wearing clothes. Sheriff Rawl. And how do you know that, that Sunshine loves wearing clothes? Friend Lightsey. Well... She lets me put them on her, doesn't she? Sheriff Rawl. A dog will allow his or her human to do anything to him or her without a fight. Don't you remember the debacle in Bastrop, Louisiana? Fran Lightsey. Sir, dressing a dog in cute, stylish clothes and taking photos is a lot different from dog violence and making a video of it and posting it online. Wouldn't you agree? Sheriff Rawl. Five seconds of hardcore silence. Fran Lightsey, and I didn't make that video. I'm watching it right now. Look at her, on a dance floor with no partner. And, and she looks so lonesome. Who would do that? It is too weird. Wilson is looking at the Instagram photos of sunshine in tiny human sundresses, tiny Bermuda shorts and tiny tank tops, a tiny tutu, and a tiny scuba suit replete with a tiny fake mask. Her facial expression on the Instagram photos is the exact same facial expression she has in the YouTube video. He thinks about starting a case against Fran Lightsey, but the photos of a nude sunshine grinning in the kiddie pool with Fran's grandchildren, of a nude sunshine prancing in the park on a peak leash, and a nude sunshine being hugged and kissed by Fran, Fran's husband, confirmed by Fran, her daughter, her grandchildren, and perfect strangers, confirmed by Fran, still him. He figures that Sunshine spends 10% of her life being forced to look ridiculous, while the remaining 90% is filled with sincere affection and happiness. When he gets the second reported kidnapping incident, he puts together a task force. Arthur Tharp's brindle French bulldog, Jamsey, has been missing six hours, and she knows where she is. Arthur directs Sheriff Rawl to the YouTube channel, Frenchies Galore, excitedly indicating which dog is hers. It's the video with the non-discriminatory title, Oil Rig Workers. She's the brindle on the right, next to the rig tower. She's wearing a red hard hat with her name on the front. How does the kidnapper even know her name? Wilson thinks this is an excellent question and another clue to help solve the case. While Miss Alpha Tharp, age 71, retired school teacher, president of the local haiku poetry club, no moving or other violations, tells him Jamsey's story, he studies the video and is again struck by the attention to detail. There are six brindle French bulldogs on a two-scale oil rig sitting on shiny blue metallic material, which convincingly conveys a placid liquid surface. Jamsey is obviously the chief because she's made to look as though she's holding a clipboard, and she's clean. The remaining five French bulldogs are wearing sky blue coveralls with black smears on the chest, legs, and arms. Wilson believes the smears are made to imply dirt or oil. The dogs are calmly walking around the rig, sniffing areas on the mock metal structure, looking as if they're working and inspecting their work for flaws. Unlike Sunshine, Jamsey seems to be enjoying herself. There's an eager light in her warm brown eyes. She looks like she knows a happy secret and plans on keeping it. Wilson peers down at Tiger, one of the six pit bulls he rescued from his first cousin's tri-state dogfighting operation. Tiger is asleep on the porch next to Bambi Boo, while the other four vicious fighting pit bulls, Claire, Tom, Richie, and Shantae, are playing with his 12-year-old twin sons in the front yard. Do you have other dogs, Miss Tharp? No, Sheriff, I do not. But I do have a bingo cat who keeps us on our toes. What's the kidnapper saying? What's the point is he or she trying to make? He gets it with sunshine. But Jamsie? She has two pals. Does he or she think she needs dog pals? When his phone rings again, he doesn't answer but instead forwards all calls to the office. Sooner or later, he'll know what they're about. As he scrolls through and views the other videos, he can't help but laugh, because it's funny. He counts 40 French bulldogs in all, six on a beach in the French Riviera, two at an opera in Rome, four on a train going up the Swiss Alps, all wearing climate-suitable garb, including scarves, hats, and mittens, 
He watches Tin descending from and sitting in a two-scale blue and beige tour bus in front of the Parthenon in Greece. Three riding in a two-scale boat on Lake Baikal in Russia, each wearing plenty of safety flotation gear, making it obvious that the kidnappers know Frenchies can't swim. Kidnappers. Why did he think in the plural? Then he realizes that there must be more than one involved. The videos and the travel arrangements require multiple people with various skill sets. Travel agents, set designers, carpenters, drivers, videographers, editors, seamstresses and tailors, costume designers, and dog wranglers, not to mention the paperwork required for overseas travel. Good, dog-loving, animal-savvy wranglers, because the French bulldogs in these videos are happy, calm, and trusting. He'd love to see the behind-the-scenes footage. He watches the basketball video, which is comprised of morbidly obese French bulldogs milling around on a two-scale basketball court. None are interested in the ball in the middle of the court. However, they are interested in the popcorn being thrown from the stands by the invisible audience. Each dog, a blue and tan, two gray and white, two black and white, lumbers slowly toward each stationary piece of popcorn once it lands on the court. The scene cuts to a bench where a grotesquely fat chocolate French bulldog is lying there, eyes half shut, mouth open, struggling to breathe. On a hunch, Wilson scrolls down to the comments and sure enough, there are the two families of the dogs cussing the kidnappers up one wall and down another. He checks out their social media accounts, looks them up on the police database, writes down the addresses, and leaves to make a couple of visits. While driving to his destinations, he thinks about the video. Those five ridiculously fat dogs on the court, the one on the bench who'll be dead within a year, and then the lethargic gray and white French bulldog referee. He isn't even interested in the popcorn. And what a pitiful referee. He's sitting on the side of the court in his referee garb, sleeping while sitting. The coach, a fawn-colored French bulldog, is asleep on his back with his legs splayed, belly high and spread out like an overfull water balloon. Of the eight dogs in the Run Frenchy Run video, five belong to Elvin and Pearl Solomon. The remaining three belong to Truett Dovey, who lives not far from Wilson's home and will be the first place he stops. After checking the social media accounts, he thinks he knows exactly why these eight were kidnapped and that the criminal act, more than likely, saved their lives. The French Bulldog has a low center of gravity, but these on the basketball court, their bellies are touching the court. The breed has a heavy boned, wide body. This is probably why these dogs are still able to walk or waddle about. The breed has a natural muscular build, but Wilson can see no muscle tone on these dogs at all, maybe underneath all the fat. The normal large square head with soft loose skin that forms wrinkles on the head and shoulders is gone. The skin is pulled tight from the extra exorbitant weight and their eyes are bugging out of their heads. They're in so much obvious discomfort. Though the upbeat sporty music erases all noise, it does nothing to disguise the labored breathing these dogs exhibit. He watches as their little chests move laboriously up and down, their mouths never closing. Frenchies are supposed to be alert, curious lap dogs. These dogs are desperate and fighting to draw every breath they can. The average weight of a Frenchie is 28 pounds. If there's one dog in that mocked-up sports arena who weighs less than 65 pounds, Wilson will eat his steering wheel. The bright lime green tank tops and shorts, though they fit each dog perfectly, only emphasize the tragic inevitability of their predicament. When Truett Dovey answers the door, Wilson's terrible suspicions are proven correct. Truett Dovey is five feet two inches tall and like his dangerously obese French Bulldogs, the aforementioned referee, coach, and bench player, he too is dangerously obese. He suspects that Mr. Dovey isn't wearing the garishly patterned kimono bathrobe because he truly wants to, but because it's either that, a tablecloth or a 12-seat table, a California king-size flat sheet, or a tent for a family of four. And none of these items come garments are capable of expressing the obvious creative streak Mr. Dovey possesses. Sheriff, thank God. Have you found my babies? Come in, come in. Truett lives in the house he grew up in. He's 53 years old. He retired from practicing law five years ago when his mother died, leaving him, her only child, 
everything in the world belonging to her. He inherited not only the house in which he grew up, but also 200 rent houses scattered across Warrena and three surrounding counties. Truett is dragging in upwards of 200 grand a month without doing a lick of actual work. Wilson can see right away where a good portion of those funds are going. The house is over-furnished and over-decorated. The long, wide entry hole, which spans the entire length of the home, is stacked four feet deep on both sides with unopened boxes and packages. As he follows Truett down the packed hall and through the packed living room to the back of the house where the packed kitchen is, he notices a series of photos of an elderly lady with three French bulldogs. As the puppies matured and Truett took her place in the photos, the dogs became fatter and fatter. Truett has always been fat. There are empty dog bowls beside each doorway and in multiple spots in each room. By the time they arrive in the stuffed kitchen and Wilson sees all the food covering every square inch of countertop space, in the sink, on the tables, and crammed into a pantry whose door won't close, he becomes thoroughly disgusted. Before Dovey opens his mouth one more time, Wilson arrests him then and there for animal cruelty. He does not respond to the criminal's increasing hysteria as they walk to his truck. As he's about to open the back door, he hesitates. Speaking into the radio on his shoulder, he calls for one of his deputies to assist. When the request is complete, he recites the Miranda rights to Truett. When Truett, who barely paid attention in law school but went because his mother wanted him to, hears the Miranda rights being recited, he recognizes them not from the endlessly boring classes he attended, but due to his assiduous dedication to Dick Wolf's groundbreaking series, Law and Order. He has watched Olivia and Elliot, Detectives Green, Fontana, Briscoe, Curtis, Bernard, Lupo, Tutuola, Munch, Gorn, and Eames say it so many times, at least the beginning of it, that he knows the hysterics in the house are merely the prelim to the grand hysterical fit he now throws himself into with hyperbolic gusto on the front lawn of his home. Wilson calmly stands aside while Truett, heinously overweight and out of shape, rolls over the perfect lawn in slow motion. Wilson is sure that in Truett's mind, he's thrashing about like a wild man with energy to spare. The reality is that after three lethargic half rolls, which bring his kimono robe up around his shoulders to reveal, he's stark naked underneath, which brings him back to reality because he believes, thanks to the manipulative misguidance of his mother, that he's allergic to grass, which prompts him to deepen his freak out even more when he feels the grass on his bare skin and especially on his rear end and calves, he begins to scream. Help me! I'm allergic to grass! It can kill me! Help! I can feel myself being completely paralyzed! Get an ambulance! Help me! What Dovey will not understand until two years later, when both he and the dogs have lost a cumulative weight of almost 300 pounds, is that by ignoring his pleas for an ambulance and arresting him for animal cruelty, the sheriff not only saved the lives of his mother's dogs, but his life as well. The humiliating, shaming arrest had been a major wake-up call, as had learning he was not allergic to grass, and probably never had been. When he's court-ordered, forced, to go to therapy for the abuse of companion animals and be lectured once a week for two years on proper companion animal care, he comes to realize that the unbridled amount of food in his life had not been there because he craved it but because he was full of sorrow and unrecognized deep, deep resentment toward his mother for controlling his life through monetary manipulation and his unacknowledged disgust with himself at allowing it his entire life. At the end of two years, Truett Dovey, Riley, Andy, and Charles are different inside and out. They're somewhere else, both physically and spiritually. Sheriff Rawl receives updates via text and through following their social media. Truett sold his childhood home, hired a property manager, and moved to Vermont. In the last update, a slender Truett is grinning broadly as he holds hands with the petite blonde with wise, compassionate eyes. He can just see the healthy running blurs of the dogs as the happy family enjoys a brisk outdoor outing. He braces himself to find the same situation at the Solomon residence, but it's not that at all. When the front door opens, he's greeted by almost human skeletons. 
Elvin and Pearl Solomon are so skinny and frail-looking in appearance that Wilson thinks a strong wind would surely carry them away. He watches as Pearl steps back behind her husband in what can only be interpreted as a total act of deference and submission. Wraith-like Elvin Solomon asks, Have you found our children? Your children? Our dogs. Tater, Ginger, Cookie, Taffy, and Snickers. Our dogs are our children. Please, do come in, Sheriff Rawl. Wilson crosses the dark threshold to enter a medium-sized dark foyer. When Pearl Solomon turns to open a door to the rest of the house, Wilson counts the protruding bones of her spine on the back of her long, slender neck. The home is filled with light from the floor-to-ceiling windows, which quietly boast no curtains or trimmings. The house is immaculately clean. He can't see or detect one speck of dust. They pass a dining room, a formal living room, and a family room before they enter the sunroom, which Elvin designates as their meeting locale. Wilson watches as Pearl walks to stand beside a large fan-back wicker chair into which Elvin gracefully folds his too skinny body. Wilson wishes the woman would leave altogether because now, in the bright light of day, he can see her bony visage and wonders how people think extreme asceticism is all right or even attractive. This woman is apparently deliberately starving herself. The man is thin, but not nearly as thin as she is. Pearl, go get us some refreshments, dear. That's not necessary, Mr. Solomon. It's our pleasure, Sheriff Rawl. Wilson wonders if Mrs. Solomon weaved weakly as she left the room or if that was his imagination. He looks at her husband to find his head turned, eyes gazing at the wall of windows along the back of the house. Wilson follows his gaze, and his spirit is refreshed by the orderly, though spartan, beauty he sees. A large magnolia is in bloom, and two big clusters of red daylilies dot either side of the lawn. A row of huge Natchez white crepe myrtles wave peacefully in the breeze along the back perimeter fence. The grass is lush and green and perfect. So perfect that Wilson, who was born with a suspicious mind, quietly says to his host, what a lovely garden. Let's go out and walk around. I'd love to see your daylilies up close. Those red ones are something else. The look of simultaneous anger and horror that flashes across Elvin's face tells Wilson a very different story than the one he assumed was unfolding here. There's dew on the ground. I don't want you to get your feet wet. I don't mind, Mr. Solomon, but we'd sure make a messy dew trail, walking all over, admiring your blooms. Elvin Solomon just stares at the sheriff. He knows there's no sane, plausible reason to say no to the law enforcement officer, but it would almost kill him to mar the perfection he has created and allows no one to touch but himself, himself alone. That where the dogs play? Wilson asks, knowing full well they're not allowed anywhere near that terrible beauty. The dogs? The dogs. Your children. Tater, Ginger, Cookie, Taffy, Snickers. Mr. Solomon is saved from responding when his wife enters the sunroom carrying a tray laden with delectables. Plump, geometrically perfect finger sandwiches, crisp green celery sticks, fresh iced tea with lemon slices, not wedges, chocolate chip cookies, and candied pecans in a shining silver bowl. Wilson thinks Pearl is going to faint as she lowers the tray to the pristine glass top of the round wicker table. Thank you, Pearl. Sheriff Rawl, Please help yourself. After you, Mrs. Solomon. She's not hungry. I gotta tell y'all what Pearl looks like. Because you want to know, and you feel sorry for her, and you kind of don't like her, which is not right. She is, she's lovely. Pearl is lovely. Truly. She's wearing a white cotton dress that is sleeveless. The buttons on the front are covered in the same fabric as the dress. It's buttoned all the way up. The collar is small. It's pleated, well pleated, this dress. The pleats begin at the waist, but they're straight because her body is so thin. And they're perfect. The pleats are absolutely perfect. There's not one wrinkle on the entire garment. And the garment is shot through with rainbow-colored thread that makes designs of flowers, greenery or 
foliage or gives a hint of uh, the impression of foliage, leaves and maybe even parts of trees. She stands there in that lovely dress with her red patent leather flats on that got a buckle on the top, probably Prada. Her clothes are exquisite. He spares no expense. Uh, Elvin spares no expense with her clothes. I mean, she looks like a coat hanger. So the dress looks great. And it is. It's gorgeous. Probably one of a kind. She stands there weaving. The pleats moving minutely as she moves back and forth. Not even knowing she does so. Her hand is on the back of the chair. She doesn't realize that's helping her stand up. And what does she look like? She's mocha, like a Hershey's chocolate bar. Elvin is darker than she, but not like a Hershey's dark chocolate, in between Hershey's dark chocolate and Hershey's milk chocolate. Is he gorgeous? No, he's not gorgeous. Is he handsome? No. But he's got a way about him that is charming, and he moves elegantly. This guy knows how to move, how to enter a room, how to sit down, how to turn his head toward you, how to turn his head toward you and just look at you with total charming concentration. You know what I mean. Elvin. Aware and game for the dangerous theatrics, Wilson puts a look of hungry delight on his face as he politely accepts an expertly ironed white cotton napkin from Pearl's bony fingers. He reaches toward the edible bounty, then stops. He pretends to notice the time on his wristwatch on his extended wrist. He looks up at Pearl Solomon's gently weaving body and says, Oh no, I can't. My wife is cooking smothered pork chops, pan-fried Mexican cornbread, fresh from the garden butter beans, a creamy squash casserole, and homemade coleslaw. She'd have my hide if I didn't bring my appetite after she goes to so much trouble. But y'all go right ahead. He watches Pearl's eyes widen slightly in relief and hope. She's slowly reaching a minutely trembling hand toward a finger sandwich when Alvin says, No, we'll just give it to the dogs. A sentence uttered with such practiced flatness that it tells Wilson he says it over and over and over again until he'll finally kill both his dogs and his wife. As Wilson walks the handcuffed Solomons to the waiting patrol car, he orders his deputy to put Mrs. Solomon in the back of his truck. He sees Elvin is about to protest and try to take over, but when he notices and instantly understands the hard, unforgiving stare of the sheriff, he closes his mouth and accepts his fate. Accompanied by another deputy and a legal search warrant, Sheriff Rawl re-enters the house, walks back to the sunroom, and quickly re prepares a small plate of four-finger sandwiches, two celery sticks, and pours a tall glass of ice-cold tea. He'd like to take the entire tray, but he knows from experience with dogs who've been deliberately starved that small portions eaten slowly are what the emaciated body can handle. He does give the deputy the pitcher of tea. Get in the back seat with Mrs. Solomon and uncuff her. Tell her to eat and drink. She'll refuse. Tell her the sheriff said it's an order. And also tell her it's an order to eat slowly. Watch her like you're her guard, which you are. You're safeguarding her life, Murray. I'm pretty sure her husband has been withholding food from her for some time. If she eats fast, it'll hurt and make her sick. She can have all the tea she wants. Stay with her until I get there. And thank you, Murray, for your compassion and professionalism. A sober-looking young deputy thoughtfully leaves the sunroom, hands full of food for a woman being starved for no reason he can understand. Search warrant in hand, Wilson proceeds to investigate every room of the house. He can find no presence of dogs until he enters the master bedroom. In the elaborate four-poster bed, which could in fact be from the 17th century or is a custom-crafted exact replica of a 17th century four-poster bed, Wilson sees dog beds, dog toys, blankets, and chews. The bedside table is covered with bags and boxes of expensive dog treats. Though the bed is massive, there's only room for one person. When Wilson walks around the right side, he sees a small army cot hugging the floor. 
There's a perfectly folded single sheet lying on top of it. There's no pillow. The army cot is of such a height that while Pearl lies on it, and he knows it's her bed as sure as he knows there's a gun in the holster on his left hip, so while she lies on it, she cannot see anything happening in the bed, even if she sits straight up. The two refrigerators, two freezers, and walk-in pantry are stocked with fresh, beautiful food. There are meal-sized plastic containers perched on one shelf in one of the refrigerators with the dog's names professionally stamped forever on the fronts. Wilson removes them and places them on the kitchen counter and hopes that what he's thinking will soon be proven wrong. It is not. Each container holds a meal fit for a king or queen. One holds a thick grilled pork chop, English peas and carrots, mashed potatoes and mushrooms with a nearly translucent gravy for taffy. One holds a filet mignon, broiled broccoli and olive oil and lemon juice, sliced roasted baby carrots and Brussels sprouts for ginger, grilled chicken breast, green beans with almond slivers and baby new potatoes for cookie, Brunswick stew with choice cuts of perfectly cubed beef for Snickers, smoked salmon and grilled beets and wild rice for tater. Wilson slowly replaces the lids and returns the containers to their designated spots. He does so slowly, so that the simmering anger within him does not blossom into uncontrollable rage. While Elva and Pearl are in jail awaiting a trial, because no animal cruelty and neglect cases get bail in Warrena County, Wilson conducts a minor experiment with the help of his sister, Lona, owner and chef of the best restaurant in western Mississippi. Lona has achieved this honor by being a great cook who's able to imbue her dishes with all the joy and love she has in her heart to serve and comfort people. She's only open from 11 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. She told him when she opened the place, and everybody in Inada told her she had to have longer hours, that if she couldn't make a living not killing herself, then she wasn't bound to make a living anywhere. She made a living all right. She made a living enough for herself and five others. A good living. There's an around-the-block line every day she opens her doors. On two other occasions, her brother had asked her to feed prisoners. She assumed there was a special reason, and it was only for her brother to know. Lona dearly loves her little brother, so when he asks her to prepare lunches for prisoners, she does the cooking and presentation herself. She not only thoughtfully plans the prison fare, but as she prepares it, she prays the whole time. She prays for skill and wisdom in choosing the right meal. She prays for the extra bit of oomph in searing, frying, baking, broiling, poaching, grilling, or whatever manner of style the dish called for to be just a little extra special. And she prays the prisoner might feel just a little bit of the love she pours into her cooking. On the first day of prison life for Elvin and Pearl Solomon, Wilson asked Lona to prepare the exact same meals for them. The women eat an hour earlier than the men. From the guard's office he can watch, if he so chooses, every second of every inmate's life. There's absolutely no privacy in jail. Because he knows Elvin and Pearl are ignorant of the criminal law system and the workings of a jail, he has their meals served to them in their cells, and he made sure they have cells to themselves. Jail. There is literally no privacy in jail. I knew this guy, and he was a the thief. I don't know why he was a thief. It was ridiculous. It was totally ridiculous. So he goes to jail. He gets. He robs this. He, he was working at this place that had tools. It was one of these places where they got tools and you know expensive stuff. You know, like a one screwdriver or one whatever. I don't even know what they're called. One tool would be, you know, 500 bucks. Y'all know what I'm talking about, especially y'all out there who work in with machinery or anything. So this guy, that's where he was working, and he stole, and he got caught. I don't even, you know, can you imagine even being a, you, you got to want to steal bad nowadays because there are cameras. There are cameras everywhere, and they're so tiny, and they're everywhere. So he gets caught. This guy, of course, he gets caught, and they press charges, and he goes to jail. He 
and he's not he doesn't get the rig that uh you know elvin and pearl get he's in he's in the main population so he may have four roommates of cellmates so he does his time there with his cellmate and you know there's a toilet i think there's a there are toilets in uh so there that's what you have to do y'all you ever think about that so there's no privacy. There's no, like, uh, wall, even a half privacy. Everybody can see you going to the bathroom. Your cellmates, of course, are in there. And the wardens, and the wardens or the guards walking by. I mean, everybody, there's, there's zero privacy. Jail. Jail. You don't get any privacy for your thoughts either. Huh, you know? got to be on guard the whole time because it's rough and you got people in there can you imagine i mean i can't even imagine what their brains are doing in there they're sitting in general population or in their cell using bathroom in front of their cellmate what are they thinking all the time i mean what what are they thinking I guess they're thinking what I'm going to do, who I'm going to hurt when I get out. I don't know. I'm going to change. I'm going to try. How do I change? How do I do it? I didn't even know that that's even a possibility. So this guy that I was telling you about, he serves his time. He gets out and, uh, listen, he's highly skilled. This this person has a skill. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's wonderful. It has to do with uh, um, construction. And he's remarkable at this particular skill. This guy is so remarkable at this particular skill that, I mean, he can, you know, he's got to like doing it. Because how how do you become an expert at something unless you love doing it? Because you've got to spend so much time doing it in order to become the expert. So this guy is an expert. He has this particular skill. I mean, he doesn't even, he can work when he wants to. That's because let me tell you something, people are going to be clamoring uh, for this, for what this guy can do. He doesn't have to work eight to five. He can work uh, two days a week and make plenty of money. So that's what he does for a time. And then he breaks into a place and steals more tools. Steals more tools. And guess what? he goes back to jail for a long long time I wonder what he was thinking that he was not going to get caught and then when he got caught I guess he was I don't know I guess he was uh, I don't know what he was like Elvin blaming it it's not his fault it was not his fault and you know what a little bit of it it wasn't his fault and for Elvin I know y'all can't stand Elvin but maybe it wasn't Elvin's fault either The first day, when lunch is slid into Pearl's jail cell, she stares at the food for ten solid seconds. Then she quickly averts her eyes as if she's ashamed and wrong. When the food doesn't move and no one comes to berate her or take it away and give it to the dogs, her eyes return to the steaming plate with such undisguised longing that it takes all of Wilson's discipline as a man and training as an officer to refrain from going to the men's side and taking a lot of no good with him. As the silence ensues, and Pearl successfully convinces herself her husband is nowhere near, she timidly approaches the food and continues the staring. Lona prepared homemade chicken and dumplings, so juicy and so tender that they literally melt in the mouth. There's no side vegetable. Lona's chicken and dumplings are a national award-winning dish, and a side vegetable offering would be superfluous. Do y'all know, y'all know about chicken and dumplings? The first reported mention of chicken and dumplings was in the 1600s. Now, I don't know how to make chicken and dumplings, but I know how to eat them and what they're supposed to taste like. I'll tell you what Lona's chicken and dumplings were like. The dumplings are a flour concoction. Not like biscuits. Not like bread. Not like nothing you've ever tasted. And I'm telling you, if they are done properly, and they say it's all in the stock, you've got to get that stock right. If ever you wanted to have a dish that required 
intention when making it, it would be chicken and dumplings. Because I tell you something, even when you look at it, it's like you look at it served to you, it's not attractive. Chicken and dumplings are not an attractive dish. They're not. But when they are done properly, it is like nothing you have ever tasted in your life. Man, that chicken is so tender and juicy and perfect as it wades around and swims in that phenomenal broth that soupy broth it cannot be the broth of the chicken and dumplings it's not gelat it's not like it's not gelatinous it's not uh is it creamy no it's it's like this translucent heaven it's just so delicious wonderful when it meets your tongue because immediately all of those flavors are there and they're so subtle southern cooking our cooking can be rough hard on the body but we have a subtlety to our cooking that I tell you I don't know anybody who matches it not the French the Italian I'm sitting here thinking because those my gosh French and Italian food you're talking about next level or Mexican real Mexican food boy and the dumplings because at first you look at it and you got this quite frankly you got to slab a dumpling in the uh, in the in your bowl it's it's you know rectangular this is this I'm speaking of a successful chicken and dumpling uh, dish here that was prepared the the dumplings are about two inches wide and four inches long and they're how thick are they they're not very thick they can't be they're not very thin either you can all you got to do the prop the, if they're done properly you just got to like show the dumpling the spoon and it just you know kind of like just telepathically says all right look i just cut myself here come on stick it in there now and then when you eat the dumpling the first time you don't put the chicken on there you do the broth because we have chicken and dumplings everywhere so it's like you got a little bit of suspicion it's like is this going to be what yeah and then it's the dumpling that tells all the secrets because if that dumpling melts in your mouth and i'm talking truly i have had a dumpling hit my tongue and just magnificently dissolve and reveal to me every flavor that is imbued in that sauce oh my gosh delicious so delicious and you think oh man it's slimy look at it no it is not slimy it is perfect and the spoon returns to that bowl again and again and again the 1600s that's when the first reported mention of the dish of chicken and dumplings was mentioned 1600s wow and it's still here still evolving but sometimes you can't get fancy it's like leave it alone man just do just do this chicken and dumplings and if I were you I would search every southern recipe database you can get your hands on <laughs> because that's where the that's where the real chicken and dumplings recipe and I think when I was reading it that was a Virginia cookbook so oh yeah it's southern some of us know how to do it correctly he watches as pearl slowly reaches for the spork picks it up and then with the careful tenderness of a woman retrieving a fallen baby bird from a nest she sporks a little of the creamy sauce onto the four pointed tips and brings it ever so slowly to her lips as she experiences the dish loner prepared with carefully directed love and attention she begins to cry Wilson watches as she glances over her shoulder and then all around her small concrete block cell he knows who she's looking for once assured a malevolent presence can do her no harm Pearl picks up the tray sits down on the edge of her immovable steel bed and enjoys food for the first time in over five years she eats slowly she studies the food 
trying to visually discern each ingredient before shakily placing it on her tongue. She savors every second of every bite and makes sure nothing remains on her plate. She also thanks the guard who retrieves her tray and asks him to please thank the cook. When Elvin is served the exact same meal in the exact same circumstance, he shows no appreciation for anything. When the guard retrieves his tray of the half-eaten meal, he asks, how come there weren't any vegetables or cornbread? Of course, he never got another meal from Alonis. During his two-year incarceration, Elvin gained no weight and no character. Pearl's eventual confession of him starving her could not be corroborated or proven. The abuse was so subtle, so controlled, and so intelligently executed that Wilson knows he would never be convicted and Pearl would be painted as a terrible, weak human being, which she is not. Wilson keeps her in jail for six months because he knows he can't. During that time, she receives proper nutrition and counseling. The counseling and seclusion changed her life. She came to decide that it was not because she was weak that she allowed herself to be starved by Elvin, but rather due to his sociopathic and predatory nature. With the counselor, she scoured an impoverished childhood, both in education and basic care. Her mother kept having baby after baby because she didn't know how to do anything else. She had no skills, could barely read, and the emotional maturity of a 12-year-old. When the dapper and eloquent Elvin Solomon came into their lives, they were in awe of him. And when he began the controlling courtship of an 18-year-old shy and ignorant girl named Pearl, who didn't know any better, who when she saw his beautiful home that he obviously cared for with such attention, that when he asked her to marry him, she was convinced the same attention would be showered on her. Six years later, she'll admit that he did shower attention on her, but not the life-giving kind. She looks back on her time with him and can see the painstaking attention to detail that he gave to her, slowly convincing her she had everything she would ever need. He twisted her mind all up and around in endless confusing circles. It was not her fault. She'd done nothing wrong but trust and believe in a man and his vows. Sometimes counseling can make a difference. Sometimes. This was one of those times where it was a spectacular and lasting success. At the end of six months, she's granted freedom and offered a job at Lona's, for which she's grateful every second of every day. By the time Elvin is released, having served the full term since they were his dogs, he hasn't changed at all. When he goes to fetch his wife, he meets a totally different person in more ways than one. He disregards the divorce papers each time they're served because he's convinced once she sees him again, everything can go back to the way it was. But that's not what happens at all. First off, he doesn't even recognize her as she exits Lona's in her crisp new uniform, the back of which reads in glittery pink embroidered letters, Pearl's Catering, big or small, we cook it all. But she recognizes him immediately. He's sitting in the parking lot in his black SUV under the grand strong limbs of a 200-year-old oak tree. All the windows are rolled up. She knew this day would come. Not the day of his release, but this day the day of her release. Sheriff Rawl told her yesterday and again this morning of the exact hour of Elvin's freedom. She considers leaving, just, just walking to her new little white catering van, which boasts the same pink glittery slogan as on the back of her new uniform, and just, just leaving. But she knows she needs to get this over now. She also knows that he has no idea who she is. Taking a deep breath, she walks around the front of his big black rumbling vehicle, ignoring his hungry stare. When she stands in front of the driver's side door, looking at her reflection in the blacked-out reflective glass, she almost doesn't recognize herself either. The idea makes her grin, then grin some more, as she stares at the beautiful, tall, healthy, happy woman grinning back at her. Then the window comes down slowly. May I help you, ma'am? Elvin asked politely in that fake genteel manner he possesses that completely fooled her. 
He's looking at the stranger and thinking, she'd be exactly his type if she weighed 88 pounds less. What Pearl is about to say is choked from her throat when she notices who the passenger seat is carrying. Without thinking, she jerks open the driver's side door, reaches over Elvin's skeletal form, and unlatches his seatbelt. Then, with strength born and grown from heavy lifting, squatting, reaching, stirring, pinching, bending, and then even more heavy lifting, she jerks his skinny tail out of the seat and throws him on the ground. She then reaches across and quickly, but ever so carefully, picks up the three perfect purebred, black and tan, eight-week-old French bulldogs who've been sitting quietly, trusting and expecting a life of happiness and sane cherishing from their new family. With the three puppies safely in her strong and capable embrace, Pearl turns to Elvin full of a righteous wrath she had no idea lived inside her. Elvin Solomon, you serial miscreant, I'm Pearl, your soon-to-be ex-wife. You know good and well you can't ever have dogs again for as long as you live. That was a condition of your release. You will sign the divorce papers today, and I will be rid of you. You you can't be my pearl, Elvin mutters in awe, fearful of the raging Amazon standing over him. Oh, I'm Pearl, all right. And that's Sheriff Rawl coming up behind you. And this is you going back to jail for ten years. And this is me taking these little vulnerable living beings to safety. Right now, Elvin, in this time in your life, you're a man who appreciates nothing, who only knows how to destroy. But that can change. You're capable of changing everything about you. You're not my pearl, Elvin says, shaking his thin, bony head. Pearl looks down at him, anger turning into pity, turning into compassion for a human being who is as confused as she once was. Quietly, she tells him, No, Elvin, I'm not your pearl. I'm my pearl. You better not let me ever see you again. Do you understand me, Elvin? Answer me right now. I understand, but, 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 but Pearl hears nothing her soon-to-be ex-husband says. How can she, when the tiny, writhing bodies of the eight-week-old puppies are demanding her full attention and affection? Of the 40 French bulldogs who were kidnapped, only a handful are returned to their homes. Years later, the elusive YouTube channels remain undeleted and constantly updated. There's nothing Sheriff Raw can do about it, and frankly, after meeting the families, he quickly and secretly stops doing anything at all except watching the videos from time to time. He can't arrest people for incessant TV watching or for constantly staring at their phones or for allowing no noise or dirt in the home or for never leaving their homes. The dogs from these households are never returned, and after he studies the videos of the dogs from these homes, he decides that they're much better off wherever they are. Curiously, those families never get another pet. They watch the videos of their former pets wading in clear streams beneath tall, waving pine trees, running on pristine white sand beaches, or grinning into the camera as they snuggle firmly and happily with humans on deep cushioned sofas. Every now and then, one or two contacts the sheriff's office to demand action be taken. But eventually, the demands peter off to silence. After all, there's so much to see on TV and on their phones and to listen to in the sterility between the walls. Sheriff Rawl keeps a close eye on Elvin Solomon while he's in jail. He watches him, waiting for the smallest sign of change or remorse. What Elvin did to Pearl was wrong, but Wilson has been a human being long enough to know that Elvin didn't come to his twisted ways by accident. He learned it somehow. Somewhere. Some way. Most people would give up through disgust, toss him away and forget about him, not taking into consideration his past. Wilson did some deep digging on Elvin during the first year of his serving, the first of his 10-year sentence. He learned about Elvin's childhood. He saw photos of Elvin in his kindergarten class photo. The child was smiling, the joy evident in his eyes. It was in the third grade class photo that the smile's gone, and Wilson knows why. 
So he keeps an eye on Elvin, waiting for the opportunity to offer him a new way of seeing and thinking. He waits, hopes, and plans. He's not given up on the man. There is always the possibility of remarkable change. It can happen. He's seen it. Wilson Rawl waits. The moment he catches a different light shining from Elvin's still steady, contemptuous regard, he'll act. The window of opportunity may be brief. It only requires a momentary glance. When the contempt changes to confusion, even for a second, Wilson will know Elvin's time of change has come. Sometimes our actions are not who we are, but who we think we are. Who we've been told we are. The sheriff's patience and attention will pay off. Years of experience and a heart filled to the brim with compassion for his brothers and sisters have taught him people do what they're taught to do as children. Most times, never learning that those lessons are old and tired and need to go by the wayside. Not shoved aside in harsh judgment or anger, but gently, softly, so that the new way of thinking and acting slowly becomes apparent and hopefully takes over, gently, softly, permanently. Wilson waits on mental tiptoes, ever alert, knowing full well the infinite possibilities. He's seen it too many times to count, and for him, campaign slogan or not, a promise is a promise. Y'all, I love that story. Wilson Rawl, Owen and Pearl, all those French bulldogs. I love it. The tiny sets, the tiny boats, the tiny bus. I see it all. I hope that y'all did too. Thank you very much for listening. This has been Dog Food with Catherine Abel.